All right. So thank you so much, Nazan, for making the time and coming to our interview. Um, it's an honor to meet you here. Of course, I know you and I have known you for a very long time now, not even long, a few months, but you are an amazing professor and an amazing person. Now, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience and um, your, what you do right now? No, thank, thank you so much for your kind words. Like, likewise, I'm a big fan of you and your work. Um, so I'm a college professor, so a teacher. I, uh, and I'm also a researcher and a writer. I uh, teach at Wellesley College. Um, next year, I'm going to be teaching at uh, the Peace and Justice Studies Department uh, here at Wellesley College. I, um, as a researcher, I also... Um, I have an active uh, profile and I write my academic work. In addition to that, I also write uh, opinion pieces that are accessible to uh, wider audiences. My formal training is both in sociology and in political science. So I'm an uh, interdisciplinary scholar. I am generally, like in, in most general terms, interested in um, topics related to social justice, political economy, uh, conflict, uh, and social inequalities. I have uh, two main fields of expertise. Uh, the first one is um, global politics of intellectual property. So mm -hmm. I look into uh, how intellectual property, meaning patents, copyrights, and other uh, things uh, that regulate intangibles uh, are related to access to knowledge and access to health and uh, other uh, public resources. Um, I'm right now conducting a summer uh, project with a wonderful research assistant uh, on how patent protection um, impacted access to um, COVID vaccines. Oh, wow. uh, so so uh, what's, what, what went on uh, since the initial days of the pandemic uh, and how this might impact the, the next year and how uh, the COVID policies unfold. Also, my second big field of expertise is about uh, democratization in the Middle East and uh, social uh, inequalities based on ethnic discrimination. I'm more interested in uh, Kurdish question, uh, Kurdish politics, and uh, mostly uh, how things are in Turkey. I am also interested in um, issues of academic freedom that's something more personal to me because I uh, used to teach at Ankara University in Turkey and I was one of the professors who were targeted uh, by the government uh, because um, we criticized the government by signing a peace petition um, during the events of 2015 uh, and 16 when uh, government was uh, targeting uh, civilians and a lot of people uh, lost their lives. Uh, we criticized these atrocities and called it uh, a massacre. And um, after that, the, the Turkish government, uh, which is notorious for being authoritarian right now, targeted uh, professors who um, signed this petition and they um, expelled me from my position and um, revoked my passport. So that's how I found myself in the United States and how I started teaching at uh, Wesley College. Uh, and I really like my work here. This, this year I'm teaching new courses that I created on digital justice and um, technology. So, so this is who I am, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's a lot of good stuff for the people mm -hmm. who want to do something when it comes to the MENA region, especially. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, so let's get a big a bit, uh, go back in your past. Where did you grow up? Now, I personally you know where did you grow up, but uh, would you like to share where did you grow up? How was your childhood? Um, something that you would like to share with our audience? Sure, sure, sure. I, um, I grew up in Ankara, the capital city of Turkey. Um, but my parents' hometown is the Kurdish region, uh, to the eastern part of the country. And uh, I, I can say that I had a happy childhood, you know, with a very big family. Um, I just have one sister, but I grew up with the extended family. And it, it was a happy childhood, childhood personally, 
But in the same time, in the 1990s, it was a politically uh, gloomy time for Turkey, especially for Kurdish people in Turkey. I was not impacted immediately, yeah. but I was very aware of what's going on because I'm coming from a very politically involved family. Um, you know, my father was a long time uh, political activist who uh, even had some, uh, who, who was even put in prison for his political actions and who, who was even tortured and whatnot. So I was aware of what's going on. Uh, in parallel with my happy childhood, I was also um, aware of increasing yeah. inequalities and atrocities in the country. So that's like the two sides of my childhood, I think. It's, it's also very hard when someone in the West uh, asks people, ask people like us, like, how was your childhood? Like, uh, I don't know for <laughs> Turkey, but like for Afghanistan, every time you have to tell them that you had a privileged childhood, um, they assume that you are a kid of warlord uh, who had a lot of money, or you are like basically a victim who was like, you know, who is all poor and had nothing and everything. But in the middle, there were people who were actually going on about their lives, um, but at the same time were so affected by the political violence that was happening. Mm -hmm. They had to flee their own homes and everything. So it's very hard to explain that. I was privileged enough to get go to a school um, mm -hmm. and access education and have a father who would uh, play a make-believe uh, tea party with me. But at the same time, I was also exposed to the fact that when people would go missing, um, if we had questioned that uh, within the refugee communities, uh, a lot of leaders would go missing, including my father. Mm -hmm. That's something I do definitely relate to you on that one. It's very hard to explain a happy childhood, but also a very politically violent childhood. Um, no, no, definitely, this, this, this really marks our stories. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. So uh, someone from your childhood or even to this day, who is your inspiration that you think you look up to and um, you find very inspiring for the work that you do or in general um, that motivated you to pursue your education? <laughs> A tough one. This is a tough <laughs> question. It's um, not one person in particular, but yeah. I was always amazed by um, the independent, strong women uh, around me, in my family, in my extended family, and in general. Uh, of course, including like my mother. Uh, yeah. the, the thing about them is, it's they were so they were strong enough to break the vicious cycle of traditional roles yeah. imposed upon them. But again, they were not lucky enough to um, yeah. receive, let's say, formal education beyond middle school or high school. Yeah. Uh, but they were still like very strong and very independent. And that, that, but that's really something that I looked upon to all my life, uh, beginning from my childhood and also this also inspired me a lot, you know, like going one step beyond it, seeing these women who struggle a lot. And then I could maybe say this for all like Kurdish women around me, you know, like, because that's, that's a really strong figure, not just socially, politically too. Yeah. So I always found that inspiring. I uh, deliberately still would like to take inspiration from those, those individual stories. I definitely think I agree with you when it comes to political activism. A lot of political activism in Afghanistan has been more um, like if either it's too internationally involved where women get the chance to talk or no mm -hmm. women involved at all as much yeah. as other people force them like you have to accept women in your own um, society or communities um, or like somebody has to do something very different to be able to talk. Yeah. You know, but with the Kurdish women, I, 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 I kind of draw my own inspiration too, because they're like, yeah, no, I'm not going to wait for you. I'm just going to do my own thing on because this is as much as my own country or my own land as much as other persons. So and with Mexican women, too. So I think that's something that I do draw inspiration from. Um, OK, question number three. What is it that you do? I know you explained in uh, detail um, what you do, but what is it that you are doing right now that is something that you would like to share with our audience? 
So I'm working on a couple of projects. I mentioned the one uh, on pa pandemic patterns. Mm -hmm. And I think I find that very important um, that we need to come up with something that goes beyond reporting. You know, there, there are a lot of initiatives around the world right now to make vaccines more accessible all around the world. But we know that some areas around the world don't have any access to vaccines at all right now, but we are in a global pandemic. So we need to definitely have a, a global approach, global solution. So that's what, that's one project that I'm working on right now. And I um, uh, also am conducting a research on um, the Kurdish diaspora in the United States. So how uh, this immigrant community mostly uh, first and newly second generation um, Kurdish people define themselves, define, define their racial status in the United States vis-a-vis -vis, uh, being coded as white, but still facing all the discrimination because they're not white <laughs> and, um, and how their, their political engagement through social media, their political engagement with uh, their home homelands uh, is being shaped and how they, they strive to make their voices heard in um, United States foreign policy. So this is this is another side project that I'm working on right now. And um, coming back to the pandemic patents uh, project that's part of uh, and on my um, book manuscript uh, that I'm working on. It's it's about uh, patents and copyrights and uh, cultural heritage uh, and traditional knowledge. How all these like divergent different categories are being subsumed under this one notion of intellectual property and how this changes our notion of uh, property, um, moving it to the terrain of intangibles. I'm looking into uh, the global politics of it. And um, I argue that there is an ongoing transformation right now. So trying to, um, try to understand you know, what's, what's, what's going on in that field too. That's amazing. I look forward to reading your book, by the way. Um, so question number four. I know the reason you do a lot of stuff, <laughs> but also the question that why do you do it? And what made you choose, um, especially the fact that you focus mainly on justice and uh, areas around justice, especially access to it in digital or like, you know, different fields and sectors. So why do you do it? And what made you do it? Another tough question, you know, when it becomes personal, it's hard to <laughs> reflect on oneself. But I think, I think this, so from my early childhood, I was always struck by, you know, what's going on around me politically, because I was able to see all these like inequalities, but I really couldn't understand what's going on. You know, it was, it was, it seemed very personal at, at some point, but in order to understand it, I, I didn't immediately want to become a scholar and researcher. I uh, <laughs> first wanted to be a journalist, actually. I did work <laughs> in a news channel for a while, <laughs> but, but then I thought, no, this is not for me. You know, it's, 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 now now it, it, it's, it's something very valuable, you know, it's like good reporting, because that's something that we don't be, it's hard to find now all around the world because of all these like structural, um, you know, inequalities in the media industry. Yeah. But yeah, but then then I um, decided that I really would like to first understand what's going on. You know, I, I kind of was able to sense, um, you know, when I started my college education, I started to sense, you know, maybe all these, it starts with Kurdish people, but it goes beyond that, right? That maybe all these atrocities, all these discrimination is related to something bigger than, you know, those day-to-day -day daily politics. So I uh, switched my lens to more global um, and more structural um, inequalities. Not only that, but also try to understand how, you know, relations of production entail these kinds of things. So I kind of uh, step back and then uh, try to zoom out to larger uh, relationships and um, structures. But then the more I studied it, I kind of also understood that the bigger structures, it's really important to understand what's going on there, like the historical backgrounds and everything. 
but then we're also missing the human agency in it yeah so like one of my main um you know findings is that it's things are not predetermined so defining the situation definition of the situation is very important to understand what's going on but we shouldn't stop there and then we should try to um understand or even suggest you know what to do to change it so my uh desire to change things um pushed me towards the academic field in order to understand them first yeah and i think you know especially later in my career i became more like policy oriented action oriented and i kind of think that it's it's not a job description but it's 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 a public responsibility for people who uh claim you know a position an intellectual position you know yeah. if you want to be like a public intellectual if you want yeah. to understand things that you cannot keep it to yourself but you also need to defend the truth out there you know yeah. tell yeah. tell what's going on and whatnot this 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 is also a, bit, a little bit related to you know what happened uh over the last couple of years in turkey and then how uh you know a generation of scholars found, found themselves in exile um how um most of my colleagues are still in turkey trying to do this but who are pushed out of the formal um university institution so so this 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 really guides me you know this public responsibility but then it it shouldn't be something like um you shouldn't be courageous to do that this is this is this is normal this is you see something you say something you define something you share it with people so so this uh is is one of the things that um motivates my work i think i i also think the fact that you have this strong sense of making people accountable in systems who have been over the course of years gotten so powerful uh because of mm -hmm. the power that they hold that you really want to make sure that you have evidence every time you uh, hold them accountable given the political situation in your own home country um i think that's also a very strong suit for the reason that you do what you do and what made you do what you do okay question number five so what is two to three research findings that um western uh, i wouldn't say western media but audience in general in the west might not might I have a myth about sometimes like when I tell them that uh, Afghanistan actually supports girls education parents actually support girls education people in the West are shocked they're like oh my god you don't you tell me I we thought people are against it but like sometimes there are so many myths about your community or like um, that you have found through research that that's not actually true there is um, a, a contrary evidence that shows that this is how my community functions so do you have anything to share with us on that your questions are getting harder and harder <laughs> so no i i think one of the main things that applies to both sides of my research is that things are not predetermined right things yeah. are not uh it's 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 really important to understand the historical structures and um and the background uh that shape what we have today but also human action really matters it matters in the middle east too it matters in afghanistan too it matters in turkey too so we cannot really uh completely dismiss you know some parts of the world with oriental conceptualization yeah. that they are backwards they can change things you know like change and progress is not something that is uh peculiar to yeah quote and quote the west but you know things are actually things are more exciting and dynamic over there because everything is up in the air you know like there's always this <laughs> chance of like going through another route so everything's that like most things are contingent too right it's so so this i think puts um a lot of emphasis on human action this puts a lot of emphasis on um strong grassroots movements this puts a lot of emphasis on girls education as you said so 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 the the importance of agency is is one of the things that emerges out of uh, my different fields of research but also 
one thing that applies to me the least is that some some things are deeper than we talk of too. You know, yeah. we, most most human rights well, violations we tend to approach them towards day to day politics and maybe like if this person goes things are gonna change. You know, if this party goes these things yeah. are gonna change. No, some things are uh, embedded in the state formations in those countries. Um, so now I'm saying this for Turkey. Let's say Turkey's uh, you know discrimination against um, Kurdish people or Armenian people. You know all kinds all kinds of uh, minorities in Turkey. Maybe like there's something structural also more structural than we thought of. Understanding this is this also is important because then it gives us the opportunity to uh, take action not just towards you know day-to-day -day politics but uh direct uh, our um both theoretical and yeah political interventions into the root causes of things so changes change is possible this is one of the main uh roots it's not a change but also change cannot be imposed from outside yeah it should it should be uh, it. Yeah. indigenous you know it should it should it should be indigenous and then there are lots of um opportunities for that there there is there is there there the the field is really um available for, for this it's just we need to um understand this potential I definitely agree with you also like when you said that it has to be within and it's not like oh if you get rid of one party the next one is gonna solve everything <laughs> this is something I can relate on um in the past two decades the two um governments or like you know the one democratic republic government that we had um all I thought was like you know this corruption is like on an extreme level there needs to be so much changes and everything and stuff like that and then when the Taliban came all the people who were anti-government uh -huh. tied that to the Taliban because they're like oh my god you know what they are honest people they are uh people who haven't had access to all this uh, unholy money and everything and they're going to change you know <laughs> because I also reflect a lot on history I was like yeah that's not going to happen and <laughs> honestly that's so true. The system of corruption is so deep in my country and that uh, people who fought 20 years justifying that this money that comes into Afghanistan, the projects that are run in Afghanistan and the government that is there in place is corrupt. But right now it's the same thing happening with them. They literally are forcing aid money and aid organizations to give money to their people. Um, they have registered NGOs on their own names just to get funding for themselves, you know, because they're not being legitimized and recognized. So I definitely agree with you getting rid of a bunch of people or uh, changing the party doesn't necessarily mean that the system will change or like you know we will get rid of that problem it might even intensify the whole issue no definitely i agree with you know there are so many similarities between afghanistan and turkey and turkey, turkey. And that matter. also we shouldn't forget about um you know how western policies facilitated all this I, like corrupt structure and everything there too i definitely agree i also think um and it's also the i think apart from the fact that Edu even our educational institutes are our political institutes are put in place just so they can serve a certain uh, ambition of a western country within that country sometimes also makes me want to question the whole idea and narrative like how much are you here to help us and how much are you here to actually just get your thing done and leave and everything like that but without further ado last question any suggestions for people who would want to follow you? I'm pretty sure there are a lot of amazing Kurdish women, Turkish women who would want to follow you or any person who is actually inspired by your work. Any suggestions for them? Any reading list that you read or books that you might have read that you would want to suggest? Um, yeah. Another tough question. <laughs> so I, I, I think anyone who might be interested in what I do as a professor, as a teacher, as a researcher, as a writer. It's um, there's plenty of information out there, right? It's 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 so wonderful that a lot of things are accessible uh, on the internet, even with like a simple like scholar Google search, <laughs> you 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 find a lot of information. Most of it is behind paywalls, unfortunately, because of this um, higher education. Uh, 
net networks we have all around the world, like the publication networks, I mean. But uh, still, a lot of things that are available. It's just the first step of, I think, um, having this kind of a training is that how to um, find rel reliable information, right? And the, the ability to uh, select, you know, what is word of, uh, you know, consideration and what is not. Because, because the problem with having this kind of accessibility to everything is that there's too much going on and yeah. it's hard to it's hard to find your own path in it so so um the best thing about an undergraduate education is that you teach <laughs> students and then you teach people about how to um how to find the information that is relatable to you and then also to develop a critical lens on yeah. any kind of uh, information that you consume, right? It could be it could be a research, it could be news, it could be even uh, you know a novel. So I always advise my students to see like to to check like where like how how this research is conducted, who conducted it, with what resources, like like who who supported them. So the social context beyond like uh, at the background of these all these kinds of information we have. Um, is, is something to consider. Also to keep in mind that like none of this is neutral, right? Yeah. There is something like objective neutral uh, science out there that yeah. you know that there's something. Uh, so so we, we need to be wary of all these positions and then um, consider you know our theoretical in, in interventions in in that big set of relationships. This is this is one of the things I think uh, to be to be uh, very, to be like very off. Also, all of this, there's there's something you know. If you study social sciences, there's something that needs to click. It's what sociologists call uh, a sociological imagination. Yeah. Right. Once you enter into that phase, there's no going back. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so it's it's something disturbing. Once you have that click on the, your social sociological imagination if, if, if it's you know open and wide open then you you definitely have to have to have that critical lens whatever whatever information uh, flow that you're <laughs> getting <laughs> get, getting getting all this information and other things uh learning something reflecting on something it's understanding something one once you have that aha moment once you have that sociological yeah imagination, it's just you 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 drank that poison and then there's no going back from that point on. So I'm not gonna mention specific names or specific yeah. books or specific people, but I think uh, trying to find you know methods, ways to learn, you know how to imagine things sociologically would be the path to um, what I've been doing. I mean, I love what I do, but I don't know whether others will find joy in this or not. I think that's a very good tip is to actually question what you are learning and what are be what you are being fed intellectually. Um, when we were young, we were in school in high school. Uh, we were taught actually not to ask questions. Teacher is always right, or something like that. And I'm pretty sure you can relate to that. Uh, Same here. <laughs> that's the culture. Um, now I push my students really hard. I'm like, why don't you ask questions? What is the reason? And I keep on asking my teachers the same thing. I'm like, do they ask questions? Do they have a question? Because a, a person who doesn't question it means it's accepting it without any critical lens. And that's mm -hmm. very harmful. And that's the reason I personally think a lot of things in my country went down and also in your country because people didn't have that critical lens. Whatever was fed to them by the leaders or anyone around them, they just took it, you know? So sometimes that helps to have that critical lens on and ask questions. And that's very important, especially for women, asking the right question and asking questions overall. So on that note, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you so much for making the time and coming in. I Thank you so much for having me.